Well, here we are, our last program of September, as we begin the slow slide into winter. But it's not feeling like winter. Where I'm at in Texas, we're looking for 93 degrees today, and I'm still running the AC. Anyway, most areas around the country are looking pretty good today, although there are a few hot spots, such as New York City. There's a look at the satellite imagery starting out about 10 o'clock this morning. And right there around New York City, you can see this band of convection backbuilding and training over the metro area. Just very persistent. And it's gradually moving eastward, so that's one good aspect to this. But nevertheless, it is dumping a lot of rain across that part of New York. There's some of the radar estimated totals. I'm not too sure how far back this goes, but in the coastal areas near JFK Airport, looks like about six to seven inches. And as you go further to the north, more in the realm of three to four inches, but still quite a bit of rain. And it's continuing to shift east down Long Island where they have flash flood warnings in effect. Looking at the surface map this afternoon, we do see that that's north of an active frontal system, probably an inverted trough extending north from that, and certainly a wraparound, maybe some warm conveyor belt, cold conveyor belt interaction across New York. And up to the northeast, high pressure across Nova Scotia, but some persistent wildfire smoke hanging on, and we did see that back on Wednesday. In the southeastern U.S., Another persistent frontal boundary extending through central Florida, arcing back up towards the New Orleans area. There has been dry air advection and stabilization into Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama. Two points still in the low 60s, but really not enough moisture to support convection. Most of that's down there in Florida. Then heading west into Texas, we pick up the dry line, starting to become active as we get into another transition season. Dew points as high as 66 around Catula, 65 at Del Rio, and tapering down to 60s all the way up towards Sioux Falls. And that's going to support rounds of showers and storms tonight. They do have a SPC marginal risk from Sioux Falls on up to Duluth. And we are expecting probably some disorganized storms towards evening and after dark, and there will be a little bit of support from the low-level jet. Well, why don't we take a look at the low-level jet? Here's Missouri, and that is the Show Me state. So in the spirit of Show Me, we'll show you the low-level jet. This is the one-kilometer plot of wind and specific humidity, which is similar to dew point. And what we see here is the low-level jet extending from about Amarillo up to Dodge City and on up towards, I guess, around Yankton. We see that the speeds indicated by the shading are about 50 knots right there around Dodge City. So that is the low-level jet. We also see moisture. Look at those green lines right there, 8 grams per kilogram. That's not a whole lot of moisture. I, I'm guessing that's maybe 50s dew points, if that but it is transporting moisture northward. And bear in mind, this is one kilometer off the surface, up at about 3,000 feet, AGL. And I did want to check that value. Uh, let's see, one kilometer is going to be about 925 millibars. There's eight grams per kilogram right there. And we basically just follow that right down to the bottom, and that's about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. So, yeah, it's not... It's not great moisture, but it is something. And what we see during the day today, the low-level jet weakens, as we typically see with the mixing. And then going into tonight, it reestablishes itself around Salina, Pratt, and on up into Nebraska. Not really a whole lot of help for the convection up there around Sioux Falls, but maybe around midnight, some sliver of it makes it up there towards Sioux City, Yankton, and then gradually tapers off. Then we get that Pacific system moving out of California and Nevada over the weekend. We're going to cover that shortly. Look at that deep southerly flow. So there it comes from the northwest moving into northern California, the maritime polar air circulating around the west side of that. You can see the cooler temperatures up there in the northwest, 40s and 50s. 
rather cool day up there at Portland, 58 and 55 at Seattle. Let's head on up north into Alaska. I forgot to plot it, but they are getting some rain around Juneau. And up in Alaska itself, cold, 20s and 30s, a little bit of snow starting to show up as we make that transition into fall. Also some snow up there in central Nunavut and a occluded system moving through the Hudson Bay region, bringing some of that cold air south. And looks like some cold air is also on the move up there in the Northwest Territories. But we'll take a closer look at that on the model graphics. Out to the east, though, some very warm air. Look at that, 66 up there near Ungava Bay, 50s out to the west, and even some 70s snaking its way up there towards the 55-degree north line. All right, so that's it for the surface analysis. So here's where we have some big changes coming up. This is the sea level pressure and thickness chart. The thickness is in red, and that's proportional to the temperature in the lowest five kilometers of the atmosphere. So we transition from very warm air right here to very cold air up there in Washington. 55 may not be very cold in Seattle, but if you go to the mid and upper levels, it gets very cold. Also some cold air in the lower, mid, and upper levels across New York and New England. And in between, that is where we find the polar front. So there's going to be one right there. We can analyze that in a little bit more detail using the surface analysis. Yeah, we do have support for a bare clinic low in Nevada. And if we run that forward through the evening, we can see things are getting very active there in the Great Basin area and the Four Corners. Low pressure over Salt Lake City tomorrow around midday, probably that cold front moving through Kingman, approaching Flagstaff and moving through Yuma with strong cold air advection in its wake. So we are looking for a cold weekend in places like Las Vegas and Reno. And moving into Sunday, things shift to the northeast. So we find the cold front roughly like this, low pressure near Cheyenne, and a secondary frontal system up to the north, maybe something like that, and then the warm front from Bismarck to the arrowhead of Minnesota. Then the map for Monday, things are going to shift pretty much to the northeast rather than to the east. You can see that front has barely made it out of the Rockies, so not much help for the high plains. We're still going to be pumping up that moisture and warmth, and that's going to give us more of a wet, warm pattern in the Great Plains. And only by midweek, yeah, that's going to be about Wednesday or Thursday, do we finally see that front starting to shift into the central U.S. And it's going to be slow going. I did notice that the models have slowed down the southward progress, taking a big chunk of that cold air more towards the northeast, and not as much down to the south. But that's how things are looking. At least we will get some thermal troughing in the central U.S. That will cool things down a bit late in the week. That's a little pocket of cold air moving across Illinois, probably associated with a cutoff low. And it looks like a secondary surge developing up there around Montana. Now, this is 174 hours out, and the models back on Wednesday did not do very good in the long term. So we'll see about this. But there is the possibility for another reinforcing shot of cold air coming down around the 7th or 8th and into the 9th. And that looks like a lot of cold air. You can see the 540 line coming all the way down towards Milwaukee, Pittsburgh, and Albany. The 540 decameter 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness line associated with the rain-snow transition line. So again, this is pretty far out. The models may be in error, but there is the potential for some very cold air in parts of the northeastern U.S. As far as overnight lows, this is pretty far out there. This is the 9th of October. Pivotal weather showing 20s and 30s in the Great Lakes area. 30s all the way down the Appalachians. And it should be pointed out the GFS tends to be a little bit more aggressive with this cold air. So we'll just check on it next week and see if it has modified or if it looks worse. And there's the big wild card out there in the Gulf of California. 
a decaying tropical cyclone coming inland, and if that happens, that would spread a whole lot of moisture into parts of the southwestern U.S. and bump up the precip chances inland. The wind field, however, will not make it very far inland. Anyway, that's way out in crystal ball territory. We're not going to worry about that, and we could very well not even see a tropical cyclone out there in the Gulf of California. It's just too far out. In the Atlantic, though, we do have Philippe and Rena. Rena is accelerating very quickly to the northwest, although I guess when you actually look at the speed itself, it's not all that fast, but compared to Philippe, it is moving. Philippe, on the other hand, is dragging along near the Leeward Islands and then picking up on Tuesday and Wednesday. So there it is, the tropical surface vorticity chart and pressure. And there's Philippe and there's Rena, and you can watch them interact there. Yeah, that's definitely a little Fujiwara stuff going on. Rena accelerates to the north. Philippe hangs in behind and then makes its move to the north. Up to the northwest, though, this is dominated by a large polar high northerly flow scouring out the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf Stream area, so that's not very favorable for tropical cyclone activity. And we do have strong westerlies, and that's helping these storms to recurve rapidly to the east. So it looks like kind of a quiet tropical cyclone pattern over the next week or two. And this gives you an idea of the amount of shear out there, the blue indicating unfavorable shear for tropical cyclone development, and the brown indicating dry conditions in the mid-levels, also unfavorable. And over the next week or two, just a lot of shear out there, even out over the Cape Verde area where we see a lot of these tropical cyclones coming together. Philippe and Rena, they're kind of moving in between the areas of high shear, cutting through that Saharan air layer, but... Yeah, the Atlantic just getting carved up by high shear environments and a little bit of that Saharan air layer also hanging around as well. So let's take a look at the short term, what we're looking for over the weekend. Polar front through the Great Basin area and the Central Plains. There's the Anna front across Oregon. So they're getting some of that rain and maybe some snow in the higher elevations. And that is going to spread southward. More of that cold air is going to come down to the Sierra Nevadas for tomorrow. And we're looking at tomorrow evening here. Parts of the Sierras above 8,000 will be getting snow. And there is a winter weather advisory for the Sierras and just east of there around Mammoth Lakes. And further to the east where we have strong pressure gradients, that's going to kick up the winds up to 40 miles an hour in some places and we will see red flag warnings and wind advisories, basically from southern Arizona all the way up towards southwestern Wyoming. And we've already covered what this is going to do over the next few days, but then we shift our attention to the west. And things will be getting more active. After all, we're heading into El Nino here. You can see one atmospheric river heading into southeastern Alaska for late Saturday and Sunday. That's got IVT values of about 500 to 600 around Juneau, Ketchikan, and Prince Rupert. Then we see the next push right here for Sunday and going into Monday. That's got even more moisture, IVT values up to 1,000, and that affects southeastern Alaska pretty heavily on up from Juneau towards Haines. And there could be some flooding. It does look kind of persistent. And we had that earlier wave back on Saturday and Sunday, so it looks like a few days of very wet weather in that part of Alaska and British Columbia. And here's round number three right there moving across the Pacific, but it is too early to say what that's going to do. That's the end of the run right there, and it is heading to the east. We'll just have to wait and see what that's going to do here in the U.S. And that's all I've got for your Friday edition. I'm going to leave you with some footage taken by Greg a couple days ago out there in San Antonio. If you liked the program, please leave a comment. Also, I encourage you to let us know what's going on in your area weather-wise. That does update me on the weather around the country, but it also lets me know where you guys are at. So I can focus on your particular part of the country a little bit more. Okay, hope you have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon, and we'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Have a good one. Bye-bye.